Hello and welcome to those who are joining us. Hi, I can see lots of folks beginning to come online. If you would like, please go into the chat function and um, pick panelists and attendees. So make sure that you're commenting to panelists and attendees and let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. Um, it's really nice to, to see the names, organizations and countries of where people are attending from. So please do put um, panelists and attendees and I'll just show you how to do that by, um, hi, I'm Solly. This is where I'm actually trying to type um, and facilitate at the same time. From UK, co-founder of Futera. So you guys should be able to see that coming up now. And brilliant. We're just getting, we've got um, Alina saying hi. So let's see a few more people introduce themselves. Where are you from? Uh, organization, if you wish. Country, if you wish. So my name is, um, and please make sure that you're setting it to panelists and attendees. If you've just put it to panelists, then Aaron, Marsha and I can see it, no, see nobody else. So I've just seen that um, Ricardo and Chris uh, Schumann have only put it to, um, to panelists. So please do remember to put panelists and attendees if you are saying hi. Um, I'm sure one of our administrators will put a note on there to let you guys know that. So hello, my name is Solitaire. Um, Solitaire is a wonderfully ridiculous name in every language. So everyone, please call me Solly. I'm the co-founder of Futera and I have been hosting several of our Imagine Better webinars. Um, just before we get started um, with our amazing panelists and with our chat, um, just want to say a couple of words of introduction. So many of you will have joined one of the uh, Futera Imagine Better webinars before, oh, fantastic ones that we've, um, that we've already done, um, particularly on behavior change. And this webinar I'm so excited about because we're talking about harnessing the power of creativity for the climate movement. Now, after 20 years of working in um, sustainability, 30 years of campaigning for sustainability, but 20 years of being my job, this is what it all comes down to. Any meeting that you have, meeting about finance, meeting about behavior change, meeting about politics, what everyone always says is, yeah, but we've really got people to get on board. We've got to get the whole public to get on board. So that's why I'm so excited about talking about the power of creativity for the climate movement, because without creativity, all we are is chemistry. And arguably, climate change is as much a crisis of culture and a crisis of creativity as it is a crisis of chemistry. So a word about Futella and why we are hosting a workshop such as this. So many of you will know we're the change agency. Um, we are 70 people across London, New York, Stockholm, Mexico City and many other places now that we're all working from home. And for 20 years, it's been our commitment that we make sustainability so desirable it becomes normal. We work with a number of very large brands and businesses to do so, but also with people such as Sierra Club, with um, United Nations, with CNA Foundation, as well as with big companies such as um, Google, Formula One, PepsiCo, etc. We work all across the world. We also have an advocacy commitment as a business. So um, uh, as, a, as a change agency, we also try to change the world which we serve. Um, one of those pieces of work that we've done recently has with, been with Aaron, and he'll say a little bit more about that, the work that we've done with BAFTA, the British Academy for Film and Television Arts on planet placement. On the right-hand side, there's the Good Life Goals that many of you will um, recognize. That's work that we did with the United Nations um, to translate the 17 Sustainable Development Goals into something that individuals can take personal action on. And then there's our Declaration of Climate Emergency and our Climate Disclosure Project, which is where we believed as Futera that our industry, the marketing and advertising industry is not transparent when it comes to the clients we work for. That the average footprint of our advertising agency is smaller than a primary school. That, you know, it's coffee cups and electricity. The real brain print, the real impact of the media, of creative agencies, 
of storytelling industries is our brain print, is how we get into people's minds and tell stories. And I personally believe, passionately believe, that stories are what drive human beings. Not data and facts, not information, but stories. We tell stories to our children before we tell them any facts. We raise human beings on stories. We use parables and fairy tales to help us negotiate the world, even when we're, even when we're tiny, tiny children. And so the story that we're telling ourselves about climate change is absolutely crucial. And arguably the story at the moment of climate change is a Frankenstein story that the monster that we made will destroy us. It's a moralistic story that somehow human beings by our selfishness, by our greediness has created this climate monster and this climate monster will now destroy its creator. It's actually quite an old story. It's one that we've had as part of human storytelling um, for millennia. And the danger of that story is that we kind of want the narrative completeness. We want the story to play itself out. But of course there is another story and it's just as a compelling story. It's the story of Dorothy and the Oz. It's the story of Frodo and Sam in the Shire. It's the story of Harry Potter. And it's the story of the small, plucky, normal people against the giant monster that were never their fault for creating in the first place. It's the story of friendships forged in fire, of trickery and um, dressing up and and, and, and trying to find the, um, the, the Achilles heel of the monster. Um, and overall, it's a, it's a story of making the world a better place, even if you never started out intending to do so. And so I think that story, that story of solutions, of answers, of standing up to the monster is as important and, and perhaps even more important than the politics or technology that we have. So what's the story that people know today? This morning, so a couple of hours ago, in partnership with One Pulse, who's a wonderful online survey platform, Futera uh, did a little survey. And we only surveyed about 100 people here in the UK. Um, uh, it's just a little Pulse survey, but it's quite interesting in terms of what we found out. So this morning, we asked 100 people in the UK, does the media talk more about the problems caused by climate change or the solutions to it? And 65% of our respondents said that they talk more about the problems caused by climate change. This is consistent with every other survey we've seen on this topic, that people are hearing about the problem far more about the solutions. But people want to know about the solutions. Do you personally know enough about the solutions to climate change? 80% of people saying they'd like to know more about the solutions to climate change. And this is a representative sample of the UK. This is not, you know, this is city and rural. This is men and women. This is, this is across the UK. And so there is this desire to hear that solutions story. And it's actually really important that people hear it. Because when we ask people, do you think we can solve climate change? Not reverse climate change, not stop climate change, but solve it. 34% um, of people think that, yes, we have the solutions. 21% of people say, no, it's gone too far. And when we've done this kind of survey before, what we've discovered is that young people are more likely to feel that it's gone too far. And 45% of people, almost half of the population of the UK says, I don't know, <laughs> but I really hope we can. And that's the population that 45% of people are saying, I don't know. I don't know if we can. Those are the people who are open to the, a new story for the use of creativity to show them those solutions. So I just wanted to share those as some little, just a little pulse survey this morning to frame why it's so crucial to be having this conversation today. So having said that, I would love to introduce um, uh, two, two amazing, amazing contributors who I cannot believe said yes to us to come and join us today. Um, we've got um, Aaron, who is the head of industry sustainability from BAFTA. So working every day with the production companies, with the producers, with the TV channels that we all listen to um, and watch every day, both to work on their footprint on actually how they are improving um, the impact of production itself, lots of lights, lot of waste, but also for today's conversation, 
talking about the brain print and the stories that they tell. And we also have Marsha, who um, is the SVP of Impact at Vice Media, but who I basically call the the goddess of goodness, whose job is to uh, bring that 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 impact story, that understanding of what is the purpose of the media, and actually what is the impact that very very large media company now um, Vice can have in telling those different stories, and particularly um, in telling those stories to a younger audience. Now I'm going to come first to Aaron, and then I'm going to jump off from Aaron to Marsha. So Aaron, do you want to open with with a with a couple of comments? And also, folks, those of you online, I can see very big conversations happening online. I can see this. A lot of people have joined us. Um, if you want to ask a question, you have to put it in the Q&A. The chat is for you introducing yourself and talking to each other. If you want to ask any of us a question, please put it in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So I'll keep reminding you of that. So, Alan, tell us, what are you trying to do with the media industry here in the UK? For, for inviting me to be part of this discussion and hello to everyone so yeah, I guess explaining my job title really <laughs> is a, play, a good place to start because it's head of industry sustainability recognizing that really BAFTA despite one glitzy or two glitzy evenings um, in a year um, the real opportunity that we have is to bring the whole industry together to collaborate to understand the problem better and to kind of work out what the solutions are so that's um, I direct a project called Albert which aims to do ex exactly that bring the industry together to firstly identify the problems that we're solving work out some creative ways to, to solve them and add a bit of accountability essentially into into the whole process because when you can compare your peers next to next to your uh, next to yourself you can kind of understand um, where we fit so there's lots of things that we do to try and make that possible rather than advocating for particular program outcomes our role is to set the science so people can at least make creative decisions creative decisions from a firm understanding of what's what's going on here so we do quite a lot of training um, we also help you know, stimulate, stimulate the industry running inspiration sessions to help them identify authentic ways to bring it into the picture. And then the last thing we do on the brain prints uh, part of it is to analyze how the industry is doing and count essentially how uh, the kind of integrated the degree to which the, the broadcast industry is taking an integrated approach towards uh, climate storytelling. And we talk a little bit more about that in the, <laughs> as we move on. Thank you, Alan. And Alan, just a very quick question. Um, how do you think the creative industries are doing on telling this story? I mean, I think we've learned a lot, actually, through the kind of COVID pandemic. In many ways, people, um, we've had this conversation, Solly, haven't we? People are saying, well, what's this going to do for sustainability? Now, people wouldn't have been asking that five years ago. Um, so I think the, certainly the people I talk to are much more concerned about it are they getting it right definitely not <laughs> and you've only got to look at the research that we find that there's some great intentions out there but there's so much doom porn it's really um kind of as an issue has been given to natural history and in in many other genres is just com completely absent but I'm hopeful because there is so much more intention there has been um, at any point since I've been on this journey, which is about eight years at BAFTA. Um, so better, but room for improvement, definitely. Brilliant. Thank you, Aaron. And I think we're going to talk quite a lot about doom porn. Um, <laughs> I don't always think of Vice as being a home of doom porn, Marsha. Um, so in, particularly in terms of telling that different story, in terms of actually getting that solution story out there. And as I said, it tends to be some younger audiences who need the most convincing of the solutions. Um, tell me a little bit about how Vice goes about that. Um, so first and foremost, thanks very much for inviting me. I've never been called the goddess of goodness, so I had to jot that down. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, that could be, become a t-shirt for me. Um, thank you very much, Sally. Um, what we do that I think is uh, dramatically different than uh, what other media companies do is that we listen to our audience. Um, and our audience is primarily comprised of young people. So as are our content creators. So the people that are creating the content within the Vice Media Group across some 35 different countries globally and our audience, which is also global, have told us time and time again that climate is the number one issue for them. So it's our responsibility as a, as a 
company and as a media company to listen to our audience. So, you know, the best and most recent example is uh, Climate Uprise, which was our attempt with the absence of the uh, UN climate conference that should have happened in September, much the same way COP should have been happening right about this time. We decided to amplify the voices of the activists uh, who should have been on the streets or in the UN across the globe and turn the mic and our platforms over to them. And that's not the first time we've done that. We did it, uh, I think, believe like in the last two years with our Fridays for Future uh, campaign where we turned over our Instagram platform to activists in the regions where they were out protesting. And I believe one of the stats was in one week for some of those videos on Insta, we had over 11 million views. Um, and I think you, it sounds kind of corny and, and trite, but you, you have to meet people where they are. So as much as I am a dedicated journalist and I want people to read, you know, long form policy papers and the like, or just good old fashioned great reporting, whether it be video or uh, text, I also know that social whether it be Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter is a place where uh, minds meet. So we as a company have really poured a lot of our climate efforts into creating content that young people can immediately consume. But it's not just about consuming it. It's about hearing what they want us to report on and as you've just said, both of you acknowledge, it's about solutions. And I think that if we look at climate uprise, our language was not only to highlight activists and, and people who don't even check the activist box, but in their own way are, um, hearing what their issues are and then asking them how they need help in solving it so that it, it doesn't become this endless cycle of doom and fear about the demise of our planet. We can look at data from the stories and we can see that you know a story with a headline that may have read, uh, with the climate emergency, is this a good time for me to have a child? Um, that story performed really well because it was something that I'm sure many people were thinking about between a pandemic and a climate emergency, is this the time to start a family? So people opened that story pretty immediately, but you don't always have to have that kind of catchy title that pulls someone in to read a story. You can offer solutions and tell your audience what it is that you're thinking about and acknowledge that climate is something that is arguably the most challenging um, uh, event of our time. Uh, but people are hungry for alternate, not facts, because we live in a world of misinformation, but alternate solutions, just putting those out there that go beyond the individual, holding companies accountable, as an example, is something that we do, and politicians, trying to put those kinds of conversations front and center is what I believe our audience wants, and I think it goes beyond the vice okay. audience. So one of the things, Marsha, the work that, you know, in the old newsrooms, the line was always, if it bleeds, it leads. That mm -hmm. actually, that it's not that we've got too much about doom and negativity about climate change rather than solutions. It's just that negative stories tend to get the biggest readership. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, back in the old days of print media, rather than necessarily what we're talking about here, which is a much more um, you know, multi-platform, multi-channel media environment. Do you feel that those, so those solution stories, that those, be it the people, the individuals making change, or remember solutions can be quite hard solutions. Do you feel that, you know, are those getting as much uptake on your channel? Or is it the big, scary, ice cap melting stories that get more views? Um, as I just gave that example with a pretty sensational, if you will, headline that performed really well. Um, but I am reticent to say that 
solutions journalism around climate doesn't get traction. It may not get as much traction, but let's put it in this frame. If we aren't flooding the zone regularly with those kinds of stories, not the best analogy when we think about climate, sorry about that. Um, but if we're not consistently putting those stories out there, you can have the uh, ice cap melting, you know, fear and loathing story, but I would encourage that within either that story or as a sidebar story, we're talking about what, what could be done and what is being done. I think what is missing overall in big media company coverage around this is a desire to highlight stories, narratives around people who are being impacted, which is why I think we're talking today. So if we dedicate ourselves to showing uh, not just the Gretas of the world, but a Vanessa in Uganda, or a Shie in Pennsylvania, um, or I cannot remember the young woman's name in Berlin, who's part of Fridays for Future. When we kind of traverse the globe and highlight stories from people who at the end of the day look like us and sound like us, you get better traction. It's when it's this voice of God top down, here is the story that then makes it very problematic. Got it. Thank you, Marsha. Um, so I think we're beginning to get into a little bit about what actually makes a good story, what makes good creativity. Um, there's a little bit of feedback on the line, so I'm going to ask folks to mute themselves when we're not speaking. Um, uh, just to all of the attendees, and I can see we've got a lot of people who are joining us, um, if you want to chat, please make sure that you're choosing panellists and attendees. If you just want to talk to Hannah or the team who are who are doing the logistics, please put panelists. And I can also see questions are coming in on the Q&A. So if you wanna ask us questions, please put them on the Q&A. Um, so one of the questions that we've had come in um, is from Alina. And she's been asking around, um, and Aaron, this is for you, she's been asking around, you know, we often talk about the news media, Guardian, Guardian declaring climate emergency. In fact, quite a lot of the, um, a lot of the broadcast media have now dedicated themselves and they do a wonderful Attenborough work, you know, you get fant you know, more coverage on the news media. But what about the lifestyle media? Because that's what most people are, are consuming now. Um, cookery, clothing, travel. I know that when we worked with you on Planet Placement, you did some work which showed that um, uh, cake was mentioned on UK television, I think sort of, you know, 40 times more than the word climate was mentioned once you get out of the news media. So what is the role of telling those, telling the climate solution story outside of news? And actually in, in you know, in, you know, can you imagine us getting climate change on Strictly? Oh God, that's a good one. Strictly might be the one, although possibly with an environmental song. Uh, this is literally, so there's 70 people working at Futera. There's about five and a half of us working on this project at BAFTA. But, um, it's literally our favourite game is uh, what what show, how, what, how, what can this show do for the environment and whether it's about the collapse of the Roman Empire or about veterinary, there's always, there's always a climate angle you can find. And what I think the role of that stuff is to make it real. Because if you hear something in the news, it is distant, whether it's, whether it's in your neighbourhood or not, you know, it, it might not be connected to your life. But the role of content that know uh interacts with with the way that we live our own lives can can make it real it's kind of cements that as a as truth really and something that we need to think about so i think without it it's just it's just news and news as we said at the start isn't what speaks to our heart isn't what makes it real isn't what can what we want to talk to our friends about um but when we've seen a show that, that kind of echoes that message that we've heard from the news into the culture as well, it has an amplifying effect. Um, so I think I really think we need we need both as part of the part of the journey. The trick is you know, how do you unlock the creatives' minds to get themselves excited about it? Well, let's dig into that for a second. I'm, I can see Marsha typing an answer to someone. So Marsha, I'm going to come to you in a second when you finish typing your answer. Aaron and I will just check for a minute more. So creatives. Um, uh, 
you know, Future Hub is a creative agency, you've got creatives in the advertising industry, you've got creatives in marketing, you've got creatives in storytelling media, in TV, you know, you've got creative artists who are out there um, uh, doing graphic art in our streets. One of the things which I've found over the years is climate change can be a bit blinding to creatives when they first come across it it can it's so huge it's so terrifying whereas most storytelling be that storytelling in an advert on the tv program um, to a child is usually intimate and personal so do we have a disconnect between this massive you know geopolitical issue and then what most of our stories are which are intimate human stories about about you know love and and um uh, and challenge and they're, they're, they're very much on the personal scale is that one of the challenges and we've had a question um uh and i'm going to pronounce your name wrong sorry um from uh Bure, um who's asked should we start telling these stories of next door if it feels too big is it too far away should we how do we tell those intimate personal stories of climate change i think marcia spoke to that a little bit as well so i mean is it, when you work with creators every day is that something you're seeing and is there a solution to it it's humanizing really at the end of the day always um the, but the reality is we've all lived in many ways in in, in a society where environmentalism hasn't been a factor in, in the decisions that we've made. And that means that when people come to make those creative decisions, they think about the past rather, rather than thinking about the future. Because that's how you value, you know, you get paid more money normally if you've got more experience, you're valued on your <laughs> on your experience. So to say your whole past doesn't mean anything, it's all about the future. That's a bit of a tricky thing to say, but it is in fact kind of what's required, right? We need to stop looking at the past and, and focus on the future. And I think that is the key moment. But often it's about getting the question wrong as well when we speak to creatives. I'm very mindful, of what I, when we started doing this work, I was very mindful of not wanting to overstep my mark you know I'm a geographer I'm not a producer <laughs> so I don't want to advocate for kind of specific um, opportunities but that doesn't mean we can't say okay strictly what are you can do about climate change because there's just too many steps um, uh, in between those moments so what we've realized is we actually have to do quite a lot of work joining up those dots and creating the conditions for success it feels sometimes like we're trespassing on kind of creative uh uh, control essentially and it's it is vital that creators have the creative control in, or, in order to make sure that it's authentic when it lands but it's, it's really joining up the dots with people to help them understand how it how it can be possible um, and in kind of inviting them to do so is, mm -hmm. is the key nut of it for us and Marsha, you you said the same that actually it's about the people. Um, what you know, from a vice perspective, particularly with with young people, what have you found? Um, you know, what kind of do those can can people extrapolate up from those intimate, small, personal stories up to the enormity of the challenge? Or or if we only talk about the individual, will will we never talk about the big picture? Well, I I, I think that you know, individual action is always going to be important, but individual action isn't going to get us out of the climate quagmire that we're in. It's going to take, you know, the voices of uh, shareholders and consumers and the audience to uh, recognize that uh, maybe a brand that they love uh, could do better. And I would equate it with you know, listening to the creators, the, the creative people within the company who have said, um, we've got to talk more about how climate is impacting indigenous people. So uh, let's create beautiful visual stories that will pull the audience in. And for a few minutes, you might actually think that this is just a lovely documentary that you're going to watch. But in fact, what it is, is a documentary about a family, about the climate issue and how their lives have changed and how they are dealing with it. If we do a video, which was last year, I think one of our highest rated climate videos where it really was the story of a father and a daughter who went out to sea and the father happened to be one of the world's most famous uh, like geologists and he was going out to chart uh, you know, the ice uh, um, 
I've lost my language, but you know, one of the largest ice shelves in the world and it was uh, breaking apart. But what it was at its core was a story about a father and a daughter. But then within that story, and this is about creative narrative storytelling, it was a story about learning. It was a story about science. And it was also a story about a great friendship between a father and a daughter. So I, I think that I'm not sure if I'm getting to the heart of your question, but I, I think that you know, we, we have to be innovative around the ways we tell stories. I think that, um, you know, I think that there was a question around the Guardian being committed to climate, but also having food style, lifestyle pieces in their paper. Well, we have to support journalism. And in a perfect world, I would love for the Guardian, and we, we partnered with the Guardian, and we did a fabulous uh, survey around the importance of climate, especially, or climate discussion, especially around the United States election. And guess what we found? We found that young climate activists, young and old climate activists wanted a question in one of the US debates to be focused on climate. Did that happen? No, but thank God it became a part of a conversation and now with a new administration, we hear that all of that pushing actually this current, this incoming has to listen to the progressive end of the party that wants a Green New Deal, or at the very least to incorporate some of the issues that are important to the people that stopped protesting specifically on climate and took up the mantle for voting in this country because climate impacts all of us. Yeah. So that was a huge kind of shift for us as a country, for the climate activists who said, okay, we're gonna stop what we're doing and we're gonna get people out to vote because if we get a new administration, we'll get back into the Paris Accord. So there, were, well, there was a trickle down effect to their um, fight for democracy in many ways. Yeah. So, yeah. So one of the things that that makes me think about is I'm not sure many people are aware of the um, the Globo uh, telenovela, um, the soap operas, which are very popular um, uh, in, for, for, for in, in, in Brazil and elsewhere. And the one that was run in 2019, which was a very intimate story of love and fear and friendship um, set in the rainforest. Um, around a set of uh, and what 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 they said is that every telenovela has exactly the set you've got to have the bad woman the good woman you've got to have the love interest they followed the the absolute set um a recipe of a successful telenovela but they set it with environmental campaigners within the rainforest and it did very well and I think there's really something there around the fact if you try and tell a climate story tell a person's story in a climate story rather than the other way around. Um, so I think we're really getting something. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, got a question, um, uh, uh, Manasai has asked a question about greenwashing. And in fact, there's been several questions about, about fake news, about greenwashing, about uh, the, the, the telling the wrong story, um, be it brands in their marketing, be it uh, uh, TV personalities or elsewhere. What do, you, what do you both feel is the best way for us to prevent greenwashing? Do we need more rules? Do we need more regulations? Or do we need the positive story just to be better? So Alan, you know, what, what would you do to prevent greenwashing and prevent, prevent um, fake stories about climate change? I mean, in terms of, it's interesting in terms of fake stories about climate change specifically, and then also kind of the wrong solutions. That's, that's what I get more upset about, actually, is when you find the wrong solution in relation to, um, uh, in relation to a kind of climate issue raised on, on screen. And I think there's going to be many things that are going to solve that. Um, one is going to be just greater awareness and training of creatives, but also from a legal perspective, in the UK, there's definitely work to be done, you know, so we have the Equalities Act on one hand, and then in, this is for you know, a, a example from diversity, you know, we have an Equalities Act in law, and then on the broadcasting side, we have um, 
diversity requirements in public sector code. You know, so broadcasters have to, by law, deliver you know, a diverse range of content for diverse audiences. But when it comes to climate change, you've got the Climate Change Act, um, you've got the Citizens' Assembly, which says communication should be the number one priority um, to, to unpick this mess. And then you've got um, content publishers um, with no jurisdiction um, in terms of uh, the, the necessity to do that by law. Now, I, I'm an optimist on this. I'm like, we don't need the legislation. You know, this is about telling the story of our time. <laughs> we shouldn't need to be strong handed. And actually, if we do grab it, we're grabbing authenticity and we're speaking with to our audiences with more clarity. But I do think it is going to be part of the puzzle as we unpick is looking at the recommend, you know, looking at the Climate Change Act in the UK and what needs what needs to be done. But I think that will set the conditions for success. What will really bring it to life is create this understanding more about the impact of the things that they're talking about on screen and questioning whether they're normalizing sustainable behavior or inadvertently normalizing unsustainable behavior. Got it. And so, you know, there's there's the rules, but then there's the motivation. Marsha, um, uh, how do you prevent greenwash when you're at, at Vice? How do you make sure the stories that you're telling are solid? And also, you know, you know, it's murky out there in terms of get, getting good information. How do we make that clearer for people? Well, I mean, first and foremost, if we are working with a brand that has a desire to push out its sustainability measures so that their audience will better understand the steps that they're taking, that's branded content and it's, it's identified as such. Or if we are in partnership with a corporation that actually has a really good track record and they wanna sponsor something like an Earth Day uh, uh, extravaganza or a climate uprise, we're really um, judicious in the clients that we like to work with uh, because we don't want our audience to call us out. Uh, I've told stories previously because I've had such great relationships with some of the young climate activists who when I've mentioned some of the older organizations that may um, may have wanted to partner with us, they're like, no, you can't do that. You will lose your street cred. So again, it's the idea of listening because these young folk, I keep saying young, but it's the only thing I can think of. These climate activists, uh, because I know that I wasn't protesting at 13, you know, I wish that I had. Uh, my epiphany came much later in life, but, um, I think that by listening, we are better able to judge fact from fiction. Uh, we are at first and foremost, we straddle a very fine line between advocacy and journalism. But the one thing that we as a company have uh, remained steadfast in is our belief that climate change is real. So the science is real and we don't uh, we're not caught up in this uh, penchant of, you know, equal time for a denier. No, that's not, <laughs> that, that, that's not happening. Um, I mean, we're responsible journalists, but we're also not going to turn over our platforms to individuals who say that this is a bunch of crap. Yeah. Um, but I also think that it is super important in the, the context of this conversation, when you think about creativity, when you think about facts, and misinformation and greenwashing is that the journalism has to be supported. And that's, that's the stuff that's really complicated. But if you look at, as an example, the intersection between race and politics and the reckoning that we saw this past summer that was global. It was not just the United yeah. States. Systemic racism is everywhere. Systemic racism has impacted climate, has created climate refugees. There are people who live in areas that are toxic wastelands. Those, the more we tell those kinds of stories so people understand it is in my backyard. Yeah. It is not just happening in the Amazon. Then we're able to connect those stories in a way that people understand how it's impacting every part of your life. But when we 
took a stand as a company around brands stepping forth and saying that they were aligned as an example with Black Lives Matter. That was a huge risk for us, but it was important for us to say to brands, you've got to walk the walk. So I contend that when, when you work with a brand that says, or you work with an organization that says um, they care about this issue um, and they, they're going to put $100 million to it, great. Don't get upset that maybe they're not doing everything that they should, but if it's a baby step, that's great. And guess what? They made it public and now you can hold them accountable. So there are different ways you can think about working with uh, entities. I think that as long as you have good reporters and it doesn't necessarily mean you have a d d degree in journalism, it's that you're out there and you're aware, it's what permeates social media and it's not all fake news. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of people who are out there telling stories that are happening in their community. That's what made the internet a beautiful thing at its onset. Um, now it's become a little bit more complicated, but I do think that we have to uh, maintain strong journalistic standards. We have to speak truth to power, which I think we do. I think that every time we have individuals like the outgoing president of the United States who says, I'm the best environmental president since Teddy Roosevelt, someone did stand up and say BS. It may not have been in that press conference, but it certainly was a cavalcade of stories that happened yeah. afterwards. So you just have to keep the pressure on. Um, and I remain very hopeful uh, that continuing pressure leads to change. So Marcia, you've talked there about a whole set of issues. And we've actually had a question about someone saying, you know, is there a trade-off in these issues? There's so much to talk about. We need to talk about racial justice. We need to talk about climate change. We need to talk about poverty. There's all these 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 issues is there a sense that as creatives you kind of have to pick your cause um mm -hmm. one of the things which i think vice does very well is intersectionality of issues mm -hmm. putting to get you know and in fact you know the terminology of climate justice the terminology of environmental justice is something we just begun to put those those two together although many people have been working to do so for such a long time um at voice do you find that easy to do to put those things together or do people want to keep do people want to watch the story you know do people want to watch the story on veganism and animal rights and the story on climate change and the story on racial justice separately or do they want to see them put together um, I think that they want to see them put together. I think what uh, is important about the work that we're doing and many others is um, tell complex stories. Don't tell a singular story when there are layers. I mean, the beauty of great storytelling is it's like an onion. You just keep peeling back the layers. Sometimes you're crying the whole time because you didn't realize the depth to which this story was impacting so many different facets of your life. But I think we are committed to telling complex stories and helping our audience understand that a story that falls under the moniker of um, a series we have called Tipping Point, which prioritized indigenous voices, is that you can have a series that covers environmental justice stories about communities that are often communities that have been marginalized which i.e. means that these kinds of stories are disproportionately impacting brown and black people. You can do that in one story. You can talk about the environmental impact of that community. You can talk about that community and how it has been treated as second, third, fourth class citizens because of who they are and where they are and the, the class and economic uh, strata. So you can tell an environmental story that actually touches health, welfare, politics. Um, I deeply believe in that. And I, I think that we should not shy away from doing that. Sure, if you open your New York Times or your International Herald or uh, Der Spiegel or any other newspaper and you see that massive story and you say to yourself, it's Sunday and I'd really like to go outside this is a massive story for me to dedicate myself to. I think that 
It's also up to us to say, well, this looks like something really important that I should, I should take the time and read or understand, or my favorite, I'm pointing to my television for those that don't know why is she turning <laughs> this way. Uh, you know, TV, one of my all time favorite stories is I have a vice ring, which I, I don't have on right now. And I was on a New York City subway and a group of young men were standing over me. This is clearly pre, pre COVID because the trains are empty now. And he, one of the kids saw my ring and he's like, whoa, that's dope. Where'd you get that ring? I said, it's the company I work for. And this kid who was probably high school, junior, senior said, everything that I know about the world, I've learned from Vice videos. So for me, we just have to keep on telling those stories and tell them in the nuanced, complicated ways and trust that our audience wants that because I don't want anything that's just going to be reduced to 143 characters. Yeah. I wanna understand. And I think that that's the problem that we've experienced, especially in the last four years here in this yeah. country is a kind of distillation of, of really important information into a tweet. Into a tweet. And I think your point there, so um, in my very misspent youth, as well as reading for masters in sustainability, I also read for masters in Shakespeare, because you know, that's what you do when you want to have a productive um, career. Um, and of course, one of the things which we all learn about stories is, as you said, the more layers, the better. So I think that's a wonderful framing on uh, the fact that we can put these intersectional stories together. Now, Aaron, lots of questions coming in and some of those we might have to post online and respond to afterwards, but I can't even find the question, but someone asked a really interesting question around the fact that in Planet Placement, we talk about information, facts, and making sure people know the information. We also talk about behaviors, things which people can do, um, ways to change behavior change. I know there's lots of controversy around that, but important. But the 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 quite also brought in aspiration, the, the aspiration of the world and lives that we want to live. Because a great deal, particularly of the drama that we watch, um, you know, rom-coms, soap operas, around the world, they're selling a lifestyle. They're selling a lifestyle where the, you know, the romantic lead is living in a big house with a car, with lots of travel. Um, when we're working, you know, and advertising sells that lifestyle as well. The product might be what's on sale, but also advertising selling the lifestyle around it. Um, you know, how do we start to confront that in our storytelling? Not just the information about sustain about sustainability, not just the specific behaviors, but the entire life. You know, storytellers are, are selling us a life. How do we even begin to unpack that? I think there's lots of opportunities and it depends whether your creative response is going to be incidental or whether it's really going to get under under the skin of a particular issue but a lot of the a lot of the issue a lot of the um creators i speak to the more senior ones actually say well brilliant what more drives creativity than limitation so if we say to you know let's take um the pandemic, for example, we know that I'm a celebrity is going to be in Wales. Now that would not have happened <laughs> because if it wasn't for the pandemic. And we can we can use sustainable, um, you know, climate reality to drive all kinds of narratives that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Because we've got 30 years of or more, you know, 60 years of stories that haven't been about climate reality. So when you bring that angle in, you're immediately pushed down. A new direction you're, you're forced into a, a new area within you know as, as a result of your limitation so I think that's a real key to unpicking it and it's certainly a lot of the feedback that we get um, and that that has echoes in different ways in, in different kind of tv genres um, whether it's drama or, or comedy or, or factual entertainment um, people can take that limitation and, and do do something very different with it I think but the key is understanding it as a tool, something that's helping, <laughs> not an imposition. Um, so, so this, this as, as a tool, so you know, one of the things which matters most to every creative is eyes, is how many people are going to see this, be it an advertising creative who wants their ad on the side of a bus, to a showrunner who wants to make sure that they get more than one season, to a journalist who wants to make sure that they're byline. 
um, uh, is going to get there. What motivation is there for creatives to tell these stories? What's in it for them? Why would any creative, be they an ad creative, a marketeer, a brand, a journalist, uh, a soap opera show runner, why on earth would they put anything to do with climate change because it's big it's scary it's negative it's political you know it's why would they do it you know probably you can't need an organization saying climate change is too big scary and political to get <laughs> to be I, creative about <laughs> I, I i can because i don't have to answer the questions <laughs> so, so no but cut, come on out what's the pitch what's the pitch to a creative to say I mean, this is what you should cover it's personal you know when what you know we we measure the industry and we see we show how it's doing um, and you know, the hero statement of planet placement is imagine tv content that is more relevant th th than than ever and what our research shows is that actually the tv industry is, in terms of how it profiles issues is pushing at the old world you know we are promote we are profiling eating beef um five times more than we're talking about climate change we're promoting flying whether that is with freebies holidays prizes you know shows about airports we're doing that huge amount more times than we're even talking about climate change so if you can show a creative like mate you're on the wrong side of history here um not not in terms of the global results because no one can be accountable for for that for those results in all of their breadth but if we can um help people understand that whatever they whatever piece of content they have an opportunity to shift the needle that is that is com completely what we find excites people. You can be part of the solution, and there's loads. There's, you know, it's so hard to track what we do, um, whether it's holding sessions for screenwriters or whatever, because you, you never know where that information is going to end up. But the key ingredient is getting you know ignited about it. And I saw. I don't know who was watching his dark materials last night, and you see Lyra just walk past the Save the Arctic uh, poster. You're like, if you can get it into, if you can get it into his dark materials, you know, very fantasy land, you, what you can see in that is a creative who's like, oh, actually, I've got an opportunity just to, just to put something there to be present as part of the dialogue. Um, that, that's how you break it down, is to get them excited. Brilliant. I haven't seen it yet. Don't tell me anything else. Oh, about sorry. This. Not to, hopefully not too much of a spoiler. A, <laughs> okay. a poster on the wall. <laughs> Ma Marsha, what's what's your pitch to a young creative? Be they coming into Vice or anywhere? What's your pitch for why they should be incorporating climate into their stories? Um, I think the pitch should be because it's not only the right thing to do, but it is also um, and I've experienced this firsthand, it will help me, that creative, stay and do my best work for you. I think that there's now a kind of transactional relationship between creatives and companies that they work for. And I have found that the value add for anyone working at Vice is I can step to them and say, we believe in this climate emergency. We're gonna to put together a 24 hour, nothing but climate across all of our platforms extravaganza. We are going to tell our audience the who, what, where, and why of climate and really try to put some positive solutions out there. So as an example, that's a way to retain talent. <laughs> um, I think that by putting, um, a creative in a position to say, well, what is it that you'd like us to try and do? And giving that palette to them to uh, help that company really be able to align their, or double down, if you will, uh, their talking points around sustainability, if, the, if that is what they believe, that giving a creative within a company, the opportunity to help a company, its parent company, its employer do the right thing. I think, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but this is what came to mind, is part, part of the pitch. And I think that passion is so incredibly important right now. And I think that in this pandemic, crazy upside down world in which we live, where bad behavior, it seemingly is recognized and applauded. Uh, I don't think that applies to everyone. 
And I think that when given the opportunity, creatives want to do good. And they, it's not that we want to enforce unpaid labor, um, but I think that any time you can step to someone who is a creative and simply say, what is it that you believe in? And how can we turn that principle into something that could help broaden the conversation around, I'm assuming it would be climate, broaden the conversation around climate. So I think uh, kind of unlocking that potential and that passion to want to be a game changer, to want to do something different. I think that this encompasses most working human beings right now, that the world feels so heady and so challenging, but we're all stumped as to what to do. And especially during a pandemic where you're trapped. So it's like, what can I do? Where can I make a difference? And I think it's all about how you communicate. And if you communicate that, I know you are a creative of value and I know that climate is important to you, tell, tell me, tell us, yeah. tell this company, uh, this brand, how we can do better. Yeah. Give them that opportunity, I think is the pitch, so. I think it's a brilliant pitch um, and we'll, we'll close in a moment because we always like to give people a couple of minutes at the end of the webinar before the next one starts. Um, uh, but so when I was 13 years old, I was involved in campaigning against a nuclear dump that was being built in my town. Um, I wasn't much of a campaigner. I was an aggressor. I basically made tea for all the adults, but we won. We won. We campaigned for two years, um, giving up weekends, giving up evenings. Um, you know, daubing signs, etc., cetera. Um, and that feeling, that feeling of having, you know, given everything, my creativity, my time, my evening, my weekends to something and then winning, I've been chasing that high for 30 years. And so the, my pitch for Ever Creative um, would be, uh, you know, this is the biggest creative brief that there's ever been. This is the greatest storytelling challenge that there's ever been. This is the greatest story ever told of our generation. Um, and if you're not telling it, if you're not selling it, if you're not making this story, then your creativity will essentially be forgotten. And I think every creative wants their words, their pictures, their ideas to outlast them. Um, and let's just say, you know, if, if it, if it ain't climate, it won't last. Is something which I think all of us, um, all of us remember. I wanted to thank everybody who's attended and stayed with us. Thank you for, so much for all of your questions. We will capture this. This recording will be available. All the questions, all the chat will be available afterwards. You know, 55 minutes, nowhere near enough time to cover it. And I wish we were all in a big room together and can continue the conversation right now. I miss you all, but I'm so proud of everyone for keeping there, for plugging away, for telling these stories, for making it happen out there. Thank you. And thank you particularly to Alan and to Marsha for giving us their time and their wisdom today. Enormously grateful. Um, and I hope to see you um, at the next Imagine Better webinar from Futera. So thank you so much to everybody for joining us.